My name is Maya Shedinska, and I'll present a Marxist take on migration justice. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers and the commenters and the participants. Um, I have a handout for you that accompanies my talk, and it can be downloaded from the conference website. And the web address is whatisleftconference.wordpress.com. Um, it's under the, it's on the schedule page under the immigration and labor panel and it's labeled handout. So if you'd like to follow along with me, um, once again, the web address is whatisleftconference.wordpress.com uh, forward slash blog forward slash that takes you to the schedule page. Um, before I dive in, I just want to say a few words about my motivation for this talk. Uh, discussions about migration justice within analytic philosophy almost exclusively track a cosmopolitan nationalist dialectic that tries to adjudicate what migration justice requires um, by settling whether or not states should open or close borders. And it seems to me this isn't the most productive framework for understanding migration justice because it leaves out almost all consideration of the actual push and pull factors of migration, which are uh, economic factors and specifically the functions of global capitalism. So my talk is aimed at challenging the idea prevalent in analytic philosophical discussions, that the border debates are the primary dialectic uh, within which we must think of migration justice. So it seems disingenuous for us in the global center to materially exploit peripheral labor with one hand while offering migrants the intangible right to migrate with the other. And I wanna just point out that Alison Jagger's paper, uh, Decolonizing Anglo-American Political Philosophy, The Case of Migration Justice, also challenges the cosmopolitan nationalist dialectic by pointing out that histories of colonialism and imperialism are left out of such understandings of migration. At least they are um, in the philosophical discussions that I'm referencing. So my intervention is similar to hers in form, but I focus on the way economic realities are implicated in migration, which is largely uh, left out of her discussion. So uh, I'll start my talk by noting uh, some facts about what migration is often like. And these are on the uh, first page of the handout. So here I'm uh, starting following the handout. So many migrants die on migratory routes worldwide uh, or their health is negatively affected. Uh, migration is financially costly and migration is socially costly. Migrants leave behind families and communities and they risk exploitation and trafficking. Um, in short, migration is risky and costly for migrants. So it's not a value neutral phenomenon. Uh, perhaps this isn't news <laughs> to this audience, but I think it is news to analytic philosophers. So uh, as Alison Dagger notes, the questions arise, uh, why do they leave their homes and why do they come here? And the answer is uh, for economic gain. 70% uh, of global migration to developed states is motivated by economic gain. Uh, so the push and pull factors of migration are primarily economic. And uh, most frequently, even cosmopolitans such as uh, Jonathan Moses note that hopeless conditions lead to migration. Uh, but this only makes sense given economic inequality across states. Um, only in that context could migration alter one's economic status. So only then does migration make sense from a would-be migrant's point of view. The possibility of economic gain explains why migrants take the risks and make the sacrifices associated with migration. And global capitalism drives states economic inequality. Uh, the weakness of the domestic proletariat in developed capitalist states is closely related to imperial domination of the periphery. The falling rate of profit and need for ever cheaper labor drives expansionist neoliberal policy. Global capital privileges the center through the following mechanisms, and this is not an exclusive list. Uh, global finance and its instruments, trade conditions, loan repayment conditions, intellectual property conditions, technology transfer conditions, and the like. So capitalism drives the bulk of global migration flows, uh, if you'll allow me that generalization. Migrants from the periphery are chasing the surplus value extracted by global capital and trapped behind central states' borders. Um, so migration is driven by what Richard Wolff and Stephen Resnick call social theft. 
Uh, so what should we do about this if we are concerned with global justice and migration justice specifically? How can we equalize migration pressures across states? That is, how can we counteract states' economic inequality? Uh, and my answer is that we should tether the location of capital to the location of labor by de-alienating labor from its economic products. Um, to do this is to engage in a project that Lawrence Wilde calls de-alienation in his article, Marx Morality and the Global Justice Debate. Uh, we should make de-alienation a central principle of distributive global justice, since it can help equalize migration pressures across states. And this approach takes the onus off peripheral labor, that is potential migrants, to respond to states' economic inequality. So in the upcoming part of my talk, I help myself to Wilde's normative interpretation of Marx. And uh, this interpretation is admittedly controversial. Uh, nevertheless, I use it for the purposes of my present argument uh, to be able to engage with normative philosophical discussions. So Wilde argues that Marx was not opposed to morality as such. Uh, rather, he was opposed to so-called morality uh, that emerges under capitalism. Uh, Wilde argues that workers held ideals of emancipation and that a eudaimonistic moral perspective can be unearthed in Marx's thought. He also notes that Martha Nussbaum's uh, Marxist eudaimonistic perspective, for instance, is not informed by Marx's alienation thesis. So contra Nussbaum, Wilde wants to avoid divorcing the eudaimonistic moral vision from its Marxist motivation, which is the alienation of labor. Uh, but how can we use uh, Marxist normative principles to drive a theory of global justice and migration justice specifically? Well, Wilde argues that a project of de-alienation would require uh, the re-regulation of the global economy. Uh, but I suggest the project must be understood normatively if it is to serve any conception of justice, if it is to be action guiding, and if it is to gain traction within discussions of global justice, especially analytic philosophical discussions. Um, so action guiding this is kind of a buzzword and uh, in philosophical discussions of ethics. Um, uh, so I propose reinterpreting de-alienation, uh, which Lawrence Wilde calls a project uh, as a norm. Uh, since I'm concerned with migration justice and migration's main push factor is economic gain, I'll address the norm of de-alienation to just one of Marx's alienation theses, uh, the thesis that labor is alienated from its economic products under capitalism. So uh, migrants are largely fleeing poverty um, rather than trying to realize their full species being. Um, so what does the de-alienation qua norm prescribe? Well, it prescribes that generally uh, labor should not be alienated from and should keep in control its economic products. Surplus value should be retained by labor, social theft should be avoided, and provision must still be made for public needs, such as healthcare, education, maintenance of shared capital, and other contingencies. Uh, Marx endorses exceptions uh, to the absolute de-alienation of labor for specifically public needs. Uh, but how does de-alienation serve global distributive justice? Uh, it provides the justification for the removal of the material conditions that lead to states economic inequality. So it leads to migration justice, understood as distributive justice with regard to migration pressures. Um, so the point is, migration pressures should be equally distributed across states. Uh, how does it do this? By tethering surplus value to the location of labor and by helping create what Kai Nielsen called relations of fair reciprocity across states. Um, and how would the alienation tether surplus value to labor? <laughs> well, labor would control the surplus value it produces and thus control capital. Uh, if, human, uh, if common human interests include avoiding the risks and sacrifices often required by migration, then labor would keep surplus value local enough for migration not to be necessary. This is because provision of certain kinds of services such as healthcare and education must necessarily be local as a result of the embodied nature of those needs. 
bodies just don't move as fast or as easily or as painlessly as surplus value, um, given that uh, the overwhelmingly digital nature of financial flows. So applying the de-alienation norm would mean that surplus value would be retained locally, presumably within state borders. Uh, there would be no push or a much reduced push to migrate. I'll acknowledge that there wouldn't be no push, but uh, I, I will stick with a much reduced push. Um, and how would de-alienation as a norm support relations of fair reciprocity? By creating conditions wherein public needs were met locally, de-alienation would give rise, uh, would help give rise to fair reciprocity across states. So it would undermine the center periphery inequality. And this itself would undermine uh, the unequal distribution of migration pressures. Fair reciprocity is a conception of justice rooted in the moral equality of persons and extended to apply to states. So local labor or states could act outside of a context of foreign coercion. Uh, states equality on the global arena is not meaningful without economic equality. Right now, states on the periphery don't engage in the global economy on equal footing with central states. And exit from the global economy is not a meaningful option for peripheral states. They simply have uh, too much to lose. So without states equality on the global arena, migration pressures themselves could not be equalized. Uh, ending uh, global social theft of surplus value, which gets trapped behind central states borders, would help release migrants from the double bind of so-called choosing either endless poverty or choosing effective self-displacement. Um, De-alienation is not a standalone theory of distributive justice, however, uh, but it should be included in approaches to global distributive justice. For instance, cosmopolitan, that is liberal egalitarian approaches or radical egalitarian approaches. As they stand, cosmopolitan and radical egalitarian approaches cannot equalize migration pressures for they cannot ameliorate state's economic inequality. They just don't address the root cause of such inequality. Uh, both approaches advocate top-down redistribution schemes from the center to the periphery, which rely on the center to abnegate its wealth and act against its interests. So the likelihood of uh, meaningful redistribution of wealth is very low. Um, uh, here's a little bit about cosmopolitan approaches to migration justice. So cosmopolitans prefer open or relaxed state borders. This is based on the belief that nationality is not the kind of feature of persons that is salient to their moral or political equality vis-a-vis uh, -vis other persons globally. And cosmopolitanism or open or relaxed borders would allow labor to catch up to the surplus value it produces, uh, which is uh, transferred to central states by uh, migrating. Uh, the value is not transferred by migrating. The, the labor could is expected to catch up to the surplus value by migrating. But there are problems. One is that there is no reason why the onus to reclaim stolen surplus value uh, should be on peripheral labor. Cosmopolitan and also cosmopolitan redistribution schemes are insufficient. From the perspective of distributive justice, uh, there's no reason why uh, peripheral labor should take on the risks and sacrifices entailed by migration. Uh, why should we accept unequal migration pressures across states? Why should we accept uh, states' economic inequality? And why should we leave a system of capitalist uh, neo-imperial exploitation in place? especially since global capitalism reproduces states' economic inequality. So even if a meaningful uh, wealth redistribution scheme was implemented, its benefits would shortly be reappropriated by the center through social theft. So these inequalities are unjustifiable from within a distributive justice perspective. Uh, but what about Kai Nielsen's uh, radical egalitarian approach? And, uh, and uh, Kai Nielsen's approach is a sort of response to the Rawlsian approach, um, but in fact, I take them to be rather similar. I will read um, Nielsen's commitments um, here. So one is each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties and opportunities 
including equal opportunities for meaningful work, for self-determination and political participation, compatible with a sim uh, similar treatment of all people. And two, after provisions are made for common social community uh, values, for capital overhead to preserve the society's productive capacity and allowances are made for differing unmanipulated needs and preferences, the income and wealth, that is the common stock of means, is to be so divided that each person will have a right to an equal share. The necessary burdens requisite to enhance well-being are also to be equally shared, subject, of course, to limitations by differing abilities and differing situations. And here uh, he's referring to the natural environment, not class position. So under the radical egalitarian view, each person has a right to an equal share of income and wealth. The approach acknowledges that economic, uh, economic equality and political equality are mutually dependent. Uh, and that is not something that the cosmopolitan view uh, necessarily acknowledges. So the radical egalitarian approach also disavows the kind of economic inequality that a classic Rawlsian approach to distributive justice allows. Uh, but I suggest there are problems here too. As with the cosmopolitan approach, the radical egalitarian approach lacks a principle that would bring it about that rough economic equality obtains across states thus it wouldn't lead to conditions of fair reciprocity. It would still require a top-down redistribution of wealth, which is not forthcoming because it relies on the center to act against its own interests. Uh, yet Nielsen reminded us, never attend to ends without a careful attention to means. But while the radical egalitarian approach criticizes the effects of global capitalism, it makes little use of anti-capitalist economic principles. So here are some reasons uh, to prefer de-alienation. Uh, de-alienation as a norm specifies the means by which economic and thus moral or political equality can be obtained or helped to be obtained. I'll stick with helped to be obtained. Uh, if peripheral labor can retain the surplus value it generates, it ceases to be dependent on the grace of central capital later to uh, redistribute it. This helps undermine unequal uh, economic standing and thus helps undermine unequal moral or political standing uh, for people in states. So it helps undermine the unequal distribution of migration pressures and it also uh, helps, so therefore it helps undermine the unequal distribution of the risks and sacrifices that migration often entails. And finally, profit sharing as a method of de uh, de-alienating labor is not unrealistic, at least not any more unrealistic than top-down wealth, redis uh, wealth redistribution schemes. So we have a few uh, localized examples of, uh, of profit sharing that we can draw on uh, to show us that it is not uh, completely utopian um, to think that, uh, that profit sharing as a form of de-alienated labor um, is just unfeasible. And uh, furthermore, uh, de-alienation can help egalitarian views withstand a libertarian critique. So de-alienation can help block the argument against interference. The libertarian view is that individuals have the negative liberty to avoid the coerced assistance of others. But the alienation of surplus value from labor represents a uh, coerced assistance of others, namely of capitalists. So retaining the products of one's labor as de-alienation specifies can be understood as non-interference. Um, of course, libertarians could argue that self-ownership entails the right to enter into unequal economic relations. But this is in tension with the basic motivation of libertarian principles, which is self-interest. It's just implausible from a libertarian point of view that workers would routinely enter into alienating economic relations unless coerced. So uh, I'd like to conclude um, now and all, uh, and uh, the broad point here is just that addressing capitalism should be central to discussions of migration justice. And indeed, I believe it is central in many discussions of migration justice, just not the ones that I've been privy to. <laughs> Uh, and uh, global justice, it should be central in discussions of uh, how to address global injustice more generally. 
uh, labor in peripheral states faces a double bind, so-called choosing poverty or choosing self-displacement. Uh, but there's no reason peripheral labor should face this double bind while we do not. Uh, De-alienation is compatible with cosmopolitan, uh, that is uh, liberal egalitarian and radical egalitarian approaches to global justice, um, which are useful for accounting for non-economic push and pull factors of migration. Uh, it's also compatible with certain nationalist perspective, which I don't consider here. So de-alienation should be a central principle within any approach to migration justice. It's not a silver, uh, it's not a silver, silver bullet, obviously, uh, to use the phrase that uh, David used, um, the push and pull factors of migration that are other than economic ones must be taken into account. Um, but alienation from economic products is at the root of global inequality. So de-alienation should be the priority of those concerned with migration justice and global justice more generally. And so finally, I'll just say that as, uh, as Alison Jagger aims to sort of decolonize discussions of migration justice in uh, analytic philosophy, here my aim is to decapitalize them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, Emmanuel, feel free to take it away with your comments when you're ready. Thank you. Uh... Once again, uh, Maya Sitinska, I thought that was a very interesting uh, theoretical uh, paper on migration, uh, something that I think uh, we're too short on in the field. Uh, and so I want to thank you for, for the presentation. Um, um, and, the, you know, I, I have, however, I do have a number of questions. Uh, I, I thought that um, the um, critiques that you provided uh, are are crucial, and um, uh, I, I think it is the, the major question, and it, it represents um, the primary reason why people migrate is because of, um, uh, as, as you put it, uh, de alienation. Uh, but I would, you know, argue that. It has to do with uh, the uh, inequalities uh, and poverty uh, uh, that exist in the global south or the third world, as I would prefer to put it today. Um, I, I'd start by saying that uh, uh, almost all labor in the third world, um, I mean, all labor is exploited uh, and alienated, uh, but to a far greater extent, is labor exploited and alienated in the third world um, to the point uh, that, um, you know, we now often think of uh, uh, the end of labor and universal basic income, et cetera, uh, without taking into account the fact that um, today we have far more industrial workers in the world, um, maybe four times as many, than at any point in the history of the planet. Um, and uh, so I, I wanted to you know, say that I think you're you know, spot on in, in examining this uh, very crucial question. Um, and uh, I, I would like to kind of introduce a, a, a something that you did to an extent in the paper, uh, the idea of uh, globalization as being a manifestation of imperialism, um, uh, where profits are extracted from the third world or the global south or the periphery, how, however one wants to put it. And that extraction is one in which, um, you know, to the point where that we've, that's gone on for at least, you know, three to 500 years. And that uh, the benefits that we are now experiencing, including, um, that might, people might disagree with me here, including the working class here in this country and the West and rich countries is a consequence of the, uh, the plundering of the third world. Um, and um, so uh, when, when, you know, I, I think this whole notion of re-regulating the global economy would have to take into consideration um, 
providing for some kind of compensation for uh, uh, much of the uh, the the, wor the world and um, uh, with respect to re-regulation, and you, you mentioned Nielsen's work, uh, uh, who I haven't read. Um, uh, I think that um, that before de-alienation takes place, there is a there is a real need for uh, uh, an end of uh, surplus uh, from being uh, extracted uh, from uh, labor in the third world, and that. Uh, how a surplus real, realized outside of the zone of migration is very important as well. So, and that's something that that, that uh, you, you uh, I, I think point to. Um, I, I would argue that it's impossible to achieve a system of um, that advances uh, human needs uh, within the global system today. Uh, uh, capital is extracted. Uh, uh, from the third world, uh, and it continues to be. Um, when I say impossible, I would say that impossible under current conditions, it, we can't just apply that change. Uh, and, um, and not all states have the basic capacity to provide for their own residents. So there, there needs to be some kind of uh, redistribution on a global level. Um, and um, with respect to, um, uh, ending the dependence uh, of peripheral states, uh, one has to have a particular program to change that global system, uh, in my view. Um, I, I, I think in that sense that uh, um, um, you know, I think it, it, the deal alienation could be looked as a schematic pre prescription for changing the global e economic system and sometimes could be viewed, although I think this should be developed as abstract uh, uh, and, and nebulous. But when you say uh, uh, the egalitarians uh, often claim the center has a moral duty to engage in significant economic redistribution, but no central state fulfills this duty in practice. I think you're spot on. I mean, I think that's absolutely the, 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 the problem that um, this economic uh, dis redistribution uh, has not taken place. Uh, and um, uh, no, no state uh, is engaging in, in that process in, in any meaningful way um, uh, to, to end the exploitation on a global uh, le level. Let me just see my comments, I'm sorry. Um, all right, I'll just go for my uh, memory. Uh, uh, and so uh, I, I think uh, you've, you know, I, I think you've actually hit the, you know, most important questions in this paper. Um, I, I think the, the issue of the state and uh, state power is crucial uh, and that um, we need to raise uh, the notions of, you know, global supply and value chains and how they work to extract labor uh, and surplus value from, from workers, a system that uh, would require an end of uh, neoliberal capitalism as we have it today. Um, uh, uh, you, you did at times uh, uh, raise the question of whether something is, uh, whether it's feasible or not to uh, engage in one program or another. And I think that's actually one, um, I'd have to go back to my, my points that I made in this, the PDF. Uh, and I have to minimize my screen to uh, make all of them, but um, one of them would be, um, if I can find it, is that, um, I argue that the periphery is the site of alienation and super exploitation uh, where resources have been uh, plundered as uh, was pointed out earlier. And, and that that is the uh, touchstone that we really need to examine. Uh, I think your, your points uh, about um, uh, uh, why workers in the periphery migrate is also uh, crucial. Uh, uh, you know, when we look at uh, purchasing power parity and so forth, there's a huge uh, differential uh, in the sense that uh, 
people, and we're talking about 90% of the planet, uh, uh, do not have the, well, you know, a large proportion of that 90% of the planet do not have the means to support themselves and their, their communities, families, et cetera. And uh, uh, this system uh, is continuing and it's very hard to envision something else uh, uh, at, at uh, the moment. Let me turn this off. Some people are trying to call me. Um, like this. Um, anyway, I, I really liked uh, this paper as a whole. Uh, I, I think this uh, notion of uh, you know how global uh, capitalism reproduces uh, the system of inequality, uh, it, it, you know, and your references to uh, Pogue and uh, Schweikart uh, were, were crucial. Uh, I mean, I'd like to go on for a significant amount of time in discussing each and every one of these aspects. I don't think time permits me to, but I would like to raise uh, a question that uh, I don't think many socialists do since this is a, a, a socialist uh, conference. Uh, and that has to do with, uh, you know, how, how do we uh, envision any kind of change taking place? Uh, I mean, we're really dealing with uh, amongst the most uh, depressing issues uh, that exists in the world, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and uh, something that is right in front of our noses, but we fail to see, and that is the abject uh, poverty that exists for, you know, at least 50, 60% of the world, but, you know, at, at, you know, in general, inequality uh, between the top 10% and the bottom 90% of the world. And um, so, um, you know, I, I like to think uh, in terms of, uh, you know, as political scientists in terms of organization and uh, political parties and movements, trade unions, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I, I do see uh, we've had them in the past. Some of them have been successful projects to some degree and have lasted for a period of time and then they've gone away. And uh, so I'm gonna raise the question of revolution uh, as a possibility. Uh, and um, my, my view, and here this is something, I, I don't want to shift it, so yeah, as, as, as a possibility amongst states that are big, and if they're, they're big enough, perhaps that's possible. Uh, a, a complete transformation uh, and an expansion of certain states, because it cannot be done in small states, which uh, dominate throughout the world. Um, Here's something that I would say, I don't know if you've thought about, is that if we are to increase the uh, uh, wages, income, social uh, protections of workers in the West, it will come at the expense of workers who come and migrate uh, because uh, there is a finite uh, number of, there's finite resources on the planet and uh, uh, we have to make that choice as socialists. This is what came to me from reading your paper uh, uh, to, you know, examine whether we can survive as a planet, which I don't think we can as human beings. I have two minutes left, uh, and you know, societies uh, without a uh, absolute redistribution of wealth. I, I think that is uh, what you're referring to uh, as de-alienation. And I think it, it could come through socialism and it could, could come through growth and advance uh, of the conditions in the West if um, uh, the, uh, there is a redistribution, not just on a nation state level, but as you suggest on a, uh, I think you're suggesting uh, on a global uh, level. And that um, uh, the, the reason why people migrate is not because as, uh, David said earlier, it's not because they want to necessarily, it's because they have to, or because they're forced to. Uh, and uh, such a uh, system uh, is um, one that is increasing in, uh, in many parts of the world, uh, even if it's not increasing necessarily here in the United States, it's certainly increasing in Southeast Asia and uh, I'd say even Europe to some degree, absolutely Europe as well. Uh, anyway, I, I, uh, 
you know, I really appreciated uh, reading your paper. I'd like to read it again. And uh, uh, I wish I can see that PowerPoint too, but um, I will at some point. So thank you very much uh, for giving me the time and for your paper. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, so we're going to open up the uh, Q&A to the audience now. We don't have any questions yet from the audience. So Maya, if you want to respond, um, or David as well, um, feel free. Yeah, I'd like to respond. There are a number of points you raised, Emmanuel, and thank you so much. Um, one is to the issue of uh, redistribution of wealth. So I don't think the de-alienation thesis is mutually exclusive from the redistribution of wealth. Um, I mean, they can they should happen in tandem. Um, but if you do, but I think uh, I think sort of stopping social theft is uh, fundamental because without that, you can you're going to have to redistribute forever, um, and it's going to take ever more redistribution. Um, to get to something approaching economic equality across states. So first, let's not have, so what de-alienation, what I envision this de-alienation thesis is doing is like patching the hole in the leaking boat. Um, but then we don't wanna just have an empty boat, we wanna refill the boat. And the way we do that is with the redistribution scheme. Um, but don't, don't redistribute with a leaky boat, that doesn't, you're just gonna keep sinking anyway. Um, and uh, there were other, I, there were some other ways I can respond, but um, I'll just keep going until someone else jumps in if there's another question or comment. Um, I will, as far as feasibility, what to do, um, I don't have a good answer for that. I think uh, there's not one thing we can do. I think organizing as David and you were suggesting are crucial. Um, I think uh, sort of uh, remodeling, perhaps if even in small ways, we can start um, even in a very small scale localized fashion, remodeling businesses um, for profit sharing, that would help. Um, uh, it would help perhaps normalize the idea of, um, of stopping social theft. Um, but the question of feasibility also ties into the issue of resource of natural resources, um, which I think, uh, uh, I mean, ultimately, I, I'm not sure that the global economy as we know it is sustainable for the reason that uh, natural resources will run out at some point. Um, and so at some point it's going to become more expensive um, then it's worth to ship goods uh, across the globe. And when that happens, and when uh, analogous sort of phenomena occur that, um, that make a uh, globalized economy un economically unfeasible, I think some of the structures will have to change. Um, some of the economic structures might have to change. And that might be a moment when, um, when change is forced on us, whether in a managed way or in a chaotic way, um, that might be an opening for changing them in such a way that um, social theft is not occurring in the way it does now. But of course, all of that is still very utopian and idealistic, and I, I realize that. Um, so I'll acknowledge not having a, a wonderful answer for that question. Yeah, I don't think it's that utopian, actually. I think we've had examples, and uh, I see movements around the world uh, where um, in regions where there's high levels of migration, Southeast Asia particularly, uh, where there's a, a tremendous amount of organizing and uh, militant uh, unions that have emerged, such as the uh, KMU in the Philippines and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, um, one of the big questions that I think your paper uh, raises is, you know, how, how uh, is it possible for those who are not, uh, who produce for the consuming classes uh, in the North, uh, how are they able to capture even a modicum of a share of the surplus, which is only realized upon sale, and uh, that profit is uh, inures to uh, transnational corporations and to uh, businesses in the local areas where uh, more wealthy people live. 
in the world. So, yeah, yeah I think I think there are some financial mechanisms through which that project could be started, but that that would take a whole other paper and a whole other few hour discussion. But thank you so much for your comments. Thanks, Jay. I thought it was a great paper. All right, well, um, it's pretty quiet on the uh, Q&A front from the general audience. Um, so feel free to continue for a little bit more if you guys want to, or if David, you have any comments, but otherwise we can just end early. Uh, I mean, I can, uh, I can make another uh, comment that has to do with uh, this question of uh, uh, autonomous uh, workers organizations that uh, uh, David raised. I think it also touches uh, on Maya's paper as well, uh, uh, that um, we have all these uh, cases of workers engaged in uh, mobilization, mi migrant workers, the 2006, but even before then. Uh, and then you uh, showed in the labor notes example from 2017 uh, as being another uh, case. Um, uh, and um, I don't know if you have any, um, I don't think the AFL-CIO or any of its constituent unions are really uh, up for the task of developing a, a new model. Uh, I actually don't even think they're that interested in mobilizing immigrants, my workers and you know, who are working. Um, and they operate on you know, the basis of profits sometimes too, uh, or at least a, some kind of financial scheme. But I was just wondering if you had any ideas of what can happen with, if we could develop, is there, are there any possibilities for new um, entities to emerge that are not autonomous because we've seen the failures of autonomy uh, in the last decade or so, at least from my point of view. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't really have any yeah, you know, I don't really have, you know, concrete like examples or proposals. I mean, I would, but I would totally agree with you on what you just said. Um, that I don't think the AFL CIO is is as interested in in organizing migrant and immigrant workers as it could be, and I think that there are just problems with a lot of the the larger labor, labor unions in, in particular. I mean, I think we should still work with them and try to transform them. Um, but I, I also do think that there's a limit to um, autonomous organizing. I think we, that's why I was trying to like, Absolutely. I, I think it's a question of channeling that, that energy and that, you know, um, militant organizing that is there that comes in certain bursts, but on its own, I don't think that's going to it's going to achieve what we need. So it's a question of like institutionalization, but still keeping, um, you know, the democratic rank and file participation. And I mean, I don't know. I know their example. I don't know if like Familias Unidas por la Justicia, I think was, is an example in Washington state, um, which, you know, they've kind of, um, they've done some, they've signed contracts with, with the growers uh, out there. I know that it has like a no strikes clause in their contract and whatnot, but they have drastically improved the working conditions um, of the migrant workers there. And it was very much case of the organizing coming from the workers themselves. Um, you know, that could be one positive example despite its limitations. Um, but this is where I think that, you know, socialists, people who call themselves socialists have an important role to play here. Um, but I just don't think that it's actually that we're kind of living up to to that role that we, that we should play. But I think that yeah, I think the energy has to like kind of come from below, but have to be able to to build viable institutions. I just, it's just a really difficult and long task. Yeah, agree.